Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome everyone to House of the Unusual podcast. I'm your host, Joe Pavlansky. With me as always is the maestro of Mail Order Mysteries and owner of House of the Unusual, Eddie Guevara. Tonight's special guest is the returning Sea King, Sea Monkeys King, rather. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, Todd Machen. How's it going, gentlemen? Howdy, guys. We're doing fantastic, man. Uh, you know, uh, Joe, yeah. you just kind of give him a bigger crown, so I think you should be safe. <laughs> as long as you don't say, you know, if you would have underestimated him as the Sea Monkey King. I, I don't have to pay go- my... I don't have to pay my sea monkey tax for this week. <laughs> right. But I mean, the problem is you, you actually it wasn't a problem. You said the sea king. So it's the a bigger king. realm. You know, he's in charge of the entire ocean. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Got, got I know. As my head gets bigger, my crown needs to expand along with it. Thank you so yeah. much, gentlemen. Yeah. I'm sure Eddie's got, Eddie will send you a, a bigger crown. <laughs> well, definitely. I already have it being made. <laughs> well, before we, well, before we get started today, uh, just a few uh, things here real quick. Um, for everybody out there, if you haven't already, head over to houseoftheunusual.com. Uh, that is our website. There's an awesome forum there that you guys could uh, join and talk to some like-minded people. Today, we're going to be talking about mail-order mystery stuff. So anything that we're talking about that you're looking for, you could go on to houseoftheunusual.com and uh, ask Eddie. He might be able to get it for you. And uh, if he does have it for sale... Check out his store on eBay. It's uh, House of the Unusual. He got a lot of cool items up there, Some a lot of mail order mystery stuff that you, you might be looking for. And like I said, if you can't find it, he's the, uh, he's the man to talk to. Just drop him a line on the, uh, the forum, and he will get back to you. Uh, also, uh, I, bl- I ordered some, and I believe Todd and Eddie did as well. They're called Stupid Comics Magazines. Um, a gentleman jumped on our forum a, uh, not too long ago. And was talking to us, and here he has this really cool comic that he publishes. It's called Stupid Comics Magazine, and Stupid is spelled S T O O P I D. And his web, stupidcomicsmagazine.com. There's four issues out right now, and if you guys haven't checked them out yet, definitely head over there and, and take a look at them. They're, they're really awesome. You know, Mad Magazine cracked and far side all rolled up into one into this. Almost like retro-looking uh, comics magazine, and the, even the paper is real cool. I mean, it's yeah. it's almost like a, a mix between pulp and glossy paper. Everything's black and white, and it's really a, a throwback to all the uh, you know the funny comics and comic strips that that we remember. The stuff that's not really you know around anymore. So uh, definitely head on over and and check out that website it's stupidcomicsmagazine.com and stupid is spelled s t o o p i d and also if you are looking for your sea monkeys head over to c-monkeys.com and that's m o n k e y s and there is a ton of cool sea monkey stuff there so you could place your order there and um Todd will be very happy because he he needs those funds to get a bigger crown crown now that he is king of the sea. <laughs> so there's some definitely some cool sites for you guys out there in in podcast land to check out and speaking of sea monkeys Todd what is what's new brother? Um I don't know what's new but uh let's see this is Wednesday night and so uh we have our weekly uh sea monkey call so uh I just got off of that and there's uh, things are going good. Good things are happening there, um, both in the cottage industry side of things and then um, ma- mass market with through Dragon Eye Toys. So um, sea monkeys are growing strong and uh, on on the boom. So everything's good. Awesome. Now, what if if now I'm sure we we have some younger viewers out there or young listeners out there rather that haven't. Uh, had any experience with sea monkeys what would you recommend to somebody that jumps on your site and you know is going through all the stuff to order what would you recommend that they uh they order first to you know get them introduced to sea monkeys you know something maybe like a starter kit or something like that 
Absolutely. There, there are, uh, I think, a combination, three different combinations of starter kits on seamonkeys.com. Um, and that comes with everything that you need, your, your tank and all of your ingredients, a spoon, your directions. Um, really easy to set up. Uh, easy as one, two, three, as they say. Add, uh, add your ingredients to water and you have instant life. And um, then aside from that, there's all kinds of uh, like fun retro items and uh, like there's a, a, a jigsaw puzzle and um, there's really a really beautiful executive suite that's a big glass bowl that's really beautiful. And um, so anyway, lots of stuff to check out there and there's more stuff coming. So see my awesome. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm looking at, at the site now. You guys got some uh, some greeting cards that absolutely beautiful those, i mean those are perfect to send you know maybe for christmas or a birthday or you know just to say hi to somebody maybe you know get somebody interested in, in sea monkeys as well and send them a card with you know the website on it and let them know you know where to go to uh you know check out the sea monkeys because they are they are getting big again i see there's also some x-ray specs a, a t-shirt Yeah, Definitely those check out the website b-monkeys.com. Those greeting cards, uh, Joe. They're um, those are based off of Joe Orlando's uh, packet designs for Sea Monkeys from 1972. And anybody in the comic book world will know the name Joe Orlando. He was prolific in any number of publications. A huge major talent, and he did a lot of work for um, Sea Monkeys. Uh, more along the lines of like packaging and products and things like that. But that greeting card line is based off of Joe Orlando's original pack of arts. And um, what I did was I took those really teeny tiny blurry, you know, kind of poor quality packets and I redrew everything nice and big and sharp and clean. And it, it's, it's a really nice set of greeting cards. Yeah. They, they look absolutely beautiful. So I'm hoping maybe, you know, somewhere around Christmas for my birthday, someone sends me a, uh, a sea monkeys card. You know, I'm just, you know, just saying, you know, it, just throw it, just throwing that out there. If, you, if anybody feels like catching it, you know, you, you just, you know, it's out there. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm supposed to send you some sea monkey kits for, I think your father and somebody in his, and a niece. Is that right? Yeah, My, my niece is. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Cause I, we spoke the, the last time I told you my, my father was surprised that the, the sea monkeys were still around because he grew up in, you know, 60s and 70s. And he had his own, you know, sea monkeys that he ordered from from comic books or whatnot. And uh, I was telling him that, yeah, they're starting to make a comeback. There's different products being made with them and they're they're really exploding. So he was surprised to hear that. And he was interested in, in getting some for my nieces, which are uh, three and four, I believe, or three and five. I, I can't yeah. remember back but they would love it because they're very big on um nature and animals and and sea stuff and all that so they really i i think they would really love something like that where they could actually you know raise these sea monkeys from the egg and to you know being able to see them going around and it would be something to you know get them very interested in in the the sea monkey phenomenon so uh, uh yeah well i'll I'll do that. I'll I'll send those to you, Joe, and I'll throw in a, a set of um, greeting cards. Awesome, awesome. I'll, I'll be anxiously awaiting on my front porch for that and uh, <laughs> an empty box. You know, hopefully it's not an empty box like you know somebody you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And speaking of empty boxes, Eddie, what's new over at House of the Unusual? Well, everything is. Uh, there's a lot of new things. So, uh, well, first I wanted to bring in a very simple thing here. Uh, when Todd was saying how those, uh, you know, those cards were designed and uh, the, the thing he was really trying to say is he designed the whole thing. <laughs> you know, you know, he, he tried to beat around the bush that it was, uh, you know, inspired by this and that. But the truth is he designed the whole thing and he made sure that the world knew by putting TRM right across. Yeah, that's the, true. The that's true. So, so that, that's the first thing. And by the way, yeah. Uh, Let's just hope your sea monkeys are not in the post that Eddie Guevara gets his stuff delivered. Oh, God. Because, man, it just doesn't happen. 
<laughs> now, the, the other thing I wanted to say here is um, when you mentioned stupid comics earlier, uh, one good news that we have for the people out there that are listening is that stupid comic now has actually uh, gone into business with us. We are we're going to be doing a, a partnering in a uh, thing where the next uh, comic book that comes out is going to have a full page ad from House of the Unusual. And believe it or not, there's rumors that there might be a TRM somewhere in the uh, in the page. I was gonna say, I heard uh, the rumor that I heard was that Joe Joe Pavlansky was going to be designing that ad. Yeah, I'm yeah. waiting for him to make a a, a a full page comic strip of us, maybe some kind of undersea, you know, Keenan. So, Ski, if you're out there listening, you know. We, we wouldn't be mad if there was a little comic starring me, Eddie, and uh, and Todd, and it started uh, you know, maybe an undersea adventure or something like that. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> well, I would say, knowing how unreal I am, I, you might be mad. So uh, we'll we'll see about that. <laughs> but you know what, well, you know, Eddie, you brought up a good point. You know, going into to partners with him. You know, that's what we're we're really all about here at House of the Unusual is that we'd like to you know, we'd like to help other people out and other people help us out. And it's, it's building a community and to get the, Bob, because I, I, you know, I, I would have never known about this unless he came on the, uh, the forum site and was talking about it. And, you know, we got to find his comics and now, you know, I, I read all four of them. There's, there's zero, one, two, and three out. And I'm, I'm waiting for number four because they are, I mean, they're funny. They're, they're really they're really drawn good. I mean, he has some very good artists and, and writers in there, and uh, they're definitely. I, I, I'm definitely can't be any more happy with it. So that you know, that's what we're all about here is building a community and, and supporting each other and and just having fun, basically. You know, so yeah. I was going to mention to ski that special. Uh, I mean, I don't know who drew it, but uh, there is one poor guy that actually questioned Todd in one of those comic strips. <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, about the underworld sea monkey, and they said that he was human, and the guy was taken away. I heard to the guillotine. I'm not sure, but you know, uh, it, it would definitely be nice if it was done there. But you know, uh, Joe, you'd be surprised what's coming up ahead, buddy, because I've been uh, I have been talking to some artists about certain things for certain individuals, not to say names, you know, but I know that name starts with a T and then it ends with an M. Um, <laughs> the initials but, are Todd Machen. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I mean, that's uh, the whole thing is that uh, the good thing about it, though, is that it's going to by us being inside stupid comics, it's going to be great because uh, it's going to be kind of like in the old days where you have famous monsters of Filmland with the Captain Company uh, comic books with Johnson Smith and Honor House and American Circle Corp in the back. Uh, we're going to go back retro with that. And I think it's fantastic since uh, Ski is such a a great person. Uh, I mean, I spoke with him on the phone. Um, he's really, an, and I think we, we, it's going to be a great partnership here. Yeah. Uh, going forward. Um, yeah, but anyway. it, it, it's your uh, House of the Unusual uh, mail order novelty ad in Stupid Magazine is a perfect fit. I mean, it's. Uh, oh, it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that depends on how you want me to take that time. <laughs> you it, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, but the thing is, is that we're we're always working on something and always trying to put out, put out and promote new stuff for for everybody out there. And like I said, it's just you know have fun and ha have a good time and you know learn so, some different things. And you but know, you, that, you gotta that's just like be careful. Name of the though. game. Yeah, you gotta be careful because the last time I. Uh, I don't know what it was. I saw Todd in some corner over in his state. Uh, it came out in a newspaper ad. He foot eddies. <laughs> so, uh, you gotta That's be only for careful. Halloween to scare the kids. Yeah. I don't know what his plans were, but you know, you gotta be careful there. But anyway, uh, guys, uh, I, uh, I thought we had talked earlier. We had mentioned that we want to talk about a book that came out in 2011 and it was featured. It, it was actually the, original original opening date for the book uh was in comic-con 2011 in new york city uh mail order mysteries by kirk damaris um the book itself portrays i would say about 80 percent of my collection in there of my rarest items 
not my whole collection, of course. I'm saying 80% of the book is really all my items. Uh, then you had a lot of the mask in there that belonged to Ray Castillas. And it was a collaboration with a lot of people, uh, an effort that they put together this wonderful book that today has like 379 five stars, uh, considered a bestseller. Now I believe it did three printings and it's now out of print. So people are trying to get anywhere from 50 to $150 a book, uh, which I find ridiculous. But um, so is that, is that pic that the picture in the back with the little kid in the Superman? Is that you? No, that I think was Todd Metchin. No, was. it was not. That was Daddy Guevara. <laughs> no, I mean. It's on page 154 to be specific. Really? No, I'm looking at it. It says, left and above, Eddie Guevara, age 11, wearing a Superman costume, purchased from an Honor House ad. And then present day, Eddie, back when he had, you know, dark hair and a mustache. I, I think, you know, that's all gray and maybe a spotted patch of hair on the upper lip maybe now <laughs> yes for, for any of you out there in in internet land who haven't seen old pictures of eddie he is a dead ringer for gomez adams so um yeah yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> just don't just don't start speaking uh french <laughs> start kissing you. <laughs> you know um <laughs> The funny thing about it is uh, my mom see me, I kind of started growing the mustache again. And my mom says, oh, did uh, you really? you know, we did a, yeah, we did a Skype and she goes to me, not a Skype, uh, FaceTime. And she goes, what's that? It looks like you have a piece of bread under your mouth. I, go, I think I'm going to take it off, man. <laughs> bring, bring back the stash, man. Bring back the stash. Oh my God. So, so my, my question is, uh, with Mail Order Mysteries, and I know both you guys have the book. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy in front of me right now. Uh, what part of the book, and I, I don't know, let's begin with, uh, with Todd. Todd, what part of the book do you like? Well, I'll tell you specifically what I like. You sea monkey, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like page. <laughs> I like page. Uh, 10, 11, and 12. Let's see. What do we got on 10 is... Well, we got X-ray specs. Aqua, aqua specs. Oh, I, you know what? I, those are pretty cool. I've never seen those. Uh, you won't see them in my collection anymore because Todd took them from me. And then the Hypno coin. Yeah. Hypno that you will see in my collection. Uh, yeah. So that yeah. Uh, yeah, those were all done. Actually, um, the company changed its name to Trans Science, like in right about the turn of the sixties, seventies, and um, but before that, it was called Honey Toy Industry, and he, and Harold did a lot of wacky stuff, um, a lot of specs, X-ray specs, of course, are are the uh, kind of iconic symbol of old mail order novelty items. Um, but he did a he did a whole different array of different kind of novelty specs, a, along with a bunch of other stuff. And so, those things I'm really particular to. I know Eddie's really fond of the hypno specs as well. And um... well, I'm gonna tell I'm gonna have a trivia quiz for you guys that you don't have to answer now, but I want to see if you take a guess later. The two, one of the two there were two glasses that were sold. Yeah, the hypno glasses, believe it or not. Mostly Johnson Smith was the only company that sold them. Uh, I don't recall ever seeing any other company selling them other than Johnson Smith. But what I want to ask you guys, and I want you guys to think about this. There was another popular set of glasses that were sold. And they were sold in almost every comic book ad. And they, stop cheating, uh, Todd. Stop looking at the comic book ad. Okay? And... Uh, other than the x-ray glasses. The x-ray glasses being number one. But there was another set of glasses that a lot of people don't even mention. I don't even think they were that, even that popular. But yet almost every comic book ad had it. And um, that's a trivia question I want you to think about. But now what I was going to say is with the, uh, the aqua specs that were in that book, which I gave mine to uh, the, the, you know, well, I had no choice. Uh, I was threatened, you know. Um, <laughs> yep, that's basically. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to give them to Todd. So I don't no longer have that. I, I know there is a fact that either 
There's a second one in my collection somewhere, or I sold it, which I believe I did. Uh, so that means somebody definitely has it out there. But the one Todd has is the one that's inside Mail Order Mysteries. Um, now, have you guys give it a thought? What other set of glasses I'm talking about? The only thing I can think of is the is the um, nose, the glasses with the nose and the eyebrows and the mustache. I don't know, Todd. I think when it comes out of you, there's there's a purpose behind those words. <laughs> there there's something behind those words of the nose and the mustache and. The... <laughs> I mean, I don't wear glasses, but uh, I don't know, man. Uh, we need we need the Eddie Guevara specs. Yeah. Guevara yeah. Specs. It comes with glasses and a mustache. Well, since, since you guys, <laughs> yeah, since you guys gave up, okay, the see behind glasses. Oh, so yeah. Consider the spy glasses, see behind glasses. You, you know what? I I had a pair of those when I was young. They had like right on the corner. They had like a little mirror type film or something over them. And I, I tell you what, they from what I could recall is that they didn't work too bad. For, no, they didn't. They were actually pretty good glasses. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know where I got. I, you know what? I don't. I don't think I got it from a mail order. I might have got them from maybe Hills Department Store or maybe my you know corner grocery store. store. But yeah. I, I do remember having a pair of those when I was young. Well, the other thing, yeah, the other thing you see so much of is those telescoping glasses that. I don't know the telescope. They, pen, out, the they have pen. never been out of production. You're talking about the spy pen. Not the spy pen, but those glasses that they're like uh they have little knobs on the side and you turn them oh. and they telescope out. Yeah, the binocular glasses. Yeah. No, but I mean, but when I did mention the spy pen, which also was a microscope, that I think, oh my god, that's sold by almost every company. And yeah, I, I had one of those as well, too. And they still make them. There's actually companies out there today that make really high quality, you know, metal ones, not the plastic cheap ones that they used to sell in, in comic books. But um, yeah, you could actually go to if you go to like a um, like a spy store or something like that, you could find those. And it looks like a actual pen and it's a, you know, telescoping, you know, monocular thing that you could you could use. And, you know, they, I, I've looked at some reviews online just to see you know, what people thought of them and, and they get good reviews. So, I mean, you know, and of course you, the more you pay, the better, you know, the quality is, but they, they look really cool. Well, the thing about them is that I think the selling point that was used in the comic books is just the same thing as with the x-ray glasses. They would put a girl in the other side. It was like, that's it. Yeah. Like, sex sells. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually what made them sell through so many companies. Cause um, I think the biggest person, the biggest company that sold them, uh, other than Honor House, of course, and Johnson Smith, which had it in every catalog and every ad they ever ran. Uh, and, you know, also American Circle used to have it. But I think it was a, a company called Lakeside. Lakeside used to run full page ads in like really early comics. E even in the 80s and, and, and 90s, uh, they would run like in, in popular science and they run it and they always had the spy. Now, let me tell you something about the spy pen, even the plastic version. When you use it as a microscope, it really works. It's it's phenomenal. So let's say you're out in the woods and you get a piece of a splinter in one of your fingers and stuff. It's a really good thing to have, believe it or not. So, <laughs> you know what? And, and speaking of pens, I remember having the uh, the invisible ink. Remember that where you could send, you know, give somebody a, a note and they would wipe. I think it was paint over it or something, and the the uh, letters and all that would be revealed. Yeah. I remember having something like that because I, I, my buddy and I, we used to, you know, if we were at his house, we used to leave each other messages and all that on, you know, folded up piece of paper on, you know, one of our dressers or something. And then we'd go and, you know, decode it with the, the, the paintbrush or whatever it was and see what was on there. Usually, you know, something stupid. Hey, you know, meet up at the, the woods, you know, at five o'clock or, you know, whatever. But yeah, I remember getting one of those. And like I said, I think that was from, you know, my local uh, pharmacy store or something like that. Because they used to have a whole rack of, you know, those rack toys of just, you know, different gadgets and all that. You, usually the way that worked is that one side would have lemon juice inside the pen. 
And then what happened is when you would write something with lemon juice, obviously you can't see it, but then the other side would be a black light. And then when you flashed it on, you could see the, uh, I mean, that's how some of them worked. Um, but I, I got to tell you one, the one piece that also was very famous in mail order, and I believe it's also inside mail order mysteries was the 10 in one scope. Yeah. I was just looking at that. Yeah. That, well, you know what? Page 107, people. What was that, Todd? What page? 107. 107. I have. Oh, yeah. You know what? That, that thing is really cool. I mean, it's not as cool as you think. It's really a piece of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I have, uh, you know, the very original ones. I have about three or four of them. And then I used to sell it through mail order and I used to sell it through, you know, Popular Science. I used to sell it in Boys Life magazine. I bought a more advanced version and I bought like, you know, a couple of dozen. I would say about four dozen. I still have probably like 17 left. And I got to be honest with you, uh, the compass is about the only thing that really was good about it. Um, those, are, those are really cool. You know, you could still find, you know, there's not a 10 in one scope, but there are stuff like that that you could still find usually at like an outdoor store or something that has like a compass magnifying glass and, you know, whatever else on it, you know, usually like a, a survival type item. Yeah. That, that I see, but. Well, on that topic, um, there was a, uh, remember Pink Panther Flakes? They were like, a, they were like a frosted, Tony the Tiger frosted flakes, but they were. Oh, yeah, they, they had one of those one time, I remember. Yeah, and they they have a, and I've got, the, I mail I mailed away for that, and I still have my Pink Panther 10 in one scope, and it's pretty damn cool. And they actually sell for quite a bit of money. Now, now speaking of survival, you know, things like that. I, did either of you guys, because I, I had one, it was one of the first knives that I remember getting that had where you could take out the bottom and had a compass and then it had tightly packed in there, like some matches, fishing line, a fishing hook and um, some other stuff. Did you guys have ever have one of those when you were young? Nope. I, I had it. I had quite a few. In fact, I think that became very popular. Uh, after the movie Rambo came out. Yep, yep. That, yeah, that, that's uh, when they really started getting big. Yeah, they were, first they were pretty expensive. Uh, they were uh, selling for like $30. And then, you know, you could get them as low as $5.50. And I, I have several of them because, of course, you know, why me? Why wouldn't I buy something like that? You know? <laughs> why wouldn't you buy five of them? Yeah. yeah you ever you know, go outdoors, but you got five survival knives. <laughs> in, in fact, you know which was the best one of all? There was one called the ballistic knife that came out. And what it was, was a knife that um, they, they immediately, you know, they stopped producing it because it became illegal. It was a knife that when you press the button, it would launch the blade like 30 feet away, you know? Yeah, I, I believe they still issue those to the uh, the Russian. I believe it's the Russian army that still gets those uh, gets the ballistic knives, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, I they, do remember those. Those were those are really cool. Along with the uh, which I, I I think that they're they're legal now, but they were the switchblades. But there was one that I I used to have that it was the switchblade comb. So instead of a knife, it was a comb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well that that sold. <laughs> That was one of the best-selling things for the original uh, Fun Factory on the Lou Weiss. Uh, he told me that he used to sell those like crazy. I still have quite a few. I have like two dozen of those left. The Switchblade uh, comb. Yeah. I, oh, I, I have. Cool. They're in the original little yellow box where they came in. I have two dozen of those, and I have uh, about, I don't know, 20, 22 of the uh, uh, spy telescopes because I used to sell them. Now, one thing I wanted to tell you, though, is the ballistic knife, what they used to do is that you, you could still purchase it. That's where I got mine in Soldier of Fortune, but it came in a kit form. But you had to build it. That's why uh, that's the only way that legally you could sell it or buy it. Oh, I used uh, to I used to love Soldier of Fortune. That was when I was in high school, that was like one of my favorite magazines. I don't know if they're still around, but I used to love them. They they actually are. <laughs> I saw oh, really? one not too long ago. Yeah, I saw one in Barnes and Noble. Oh wow! I didn't. I didn't think they were still around. I used to buy those in all the way up to maybe around 2000. Probably when I got deployed in 2001 is when I stopped. The last one they were. The last one I got was when um right after the towers got hit, and it's a uh, it's a pencil drawing of uh, 
the bald eagle on the front cover sharpening his talons. I think that was the last one that I, I got, but I used to buy those all the time, when, you know, in high school and when I was I, in the army in the late nineties. Look, look how, how time has changed back in those days. I mean, not in those days, in the early eighties, even in the light, late eighties, in Inside Soldier of Fortune, there was a there was a famous mail order company called Pal. It's P A L Paladin Press, I think. Paladin right? Press, yeah. Paladin Press. You could buy everything there from. I I I've probably ordered <laughs> I probably ordered twenty books from them in the probably the late nineties. We used to order all kinds of different rifle and pistol and knife magazines and or uh, books and DVDs. But yeah, Paladin Press and. Do you remember, I think it was maybe, I think they stopped in the early 90s, but they used to advertise in there for uh, Hitman. Do you remember that? There was a real big <laughs> think about that, yeah. and people got sued because I, I think oh, some yeah. lady got a Hitman off of a, a classified ad in there. But, man, you want to talk about, you know, the ultimate mail order. <laughs> no, well, you know what's so funny about that that um, that particular magazine is the fact that there was a, a couple of the books that they used to sell in, what is it, Paladin Press? Paladin was, Press. Uh, the Poor Man's James Bond, the Anarchist 1, the Anarchist 2 book, and it showed you how to make gunpowder and <laughs> everything you need. And then there was, um, which I, I believe they made them, you could still buy them if you could publish them more. They were uh, How to Get Even books. I believe there were three in the set, and they're real... You could find them on eBay and all that right now, but they had to, uh, they had to pull. I remember back in the early 2000s, I think it was, they had to pull those off of their, uh, off of their, uh, site and all that. They couldn't sell those anymore. Yeah. I need to interject something here. You guys are scaring me. I had a much kinder, kinder, gentler childhood than the two of you. <laughs> well, I, I'm not saying those get even books are around, maybe somewhere, somebody. <laughs> I know my half a copies of those, but anyway, um, and I'm not saying who, okay? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I collected quite a few things, my friend. But uh, one thing I was going to say is the, um, you know, growing up, uh, the reason uh, Soldier of Fortune and all those magazines were so popular among the young boys and stuff, uh, especially uh, the magazines such as uh, Guns and Ammos. Done. I used to have a subscription to that too. Yeah, and, uh, you, you know, you know, Joe. Well, the thing that was funny that made those so popular, and I was talking to William Osborne when we had him on our show here, and he had the same thing as I do. Like I'm sure we still have those books, but you know what's really bizarre about the funniest thing about that is, here's the thing, Honor House, the company Honor House, when it sold. Later on in life, Honor House in the late 80s, not I mean, the early 80s, uh, when it was kind of turning over to the next phase, which it, it later became guaranteed distributors, what they did is that they took the plastic pellet firing guns. And the selling point was, you don't need a permit. Now, why the hell would you need a permit for a gun? You, you shoot into the palm of your hand. <laughs> you know, it has a little plastic bullet. But the thing is that they sold them for $4.95. And they took off with that, man. I think it lasted like a good 10 years. And the magazines that were patronized by those companies, all those famous mail order companies, were Starlight Detective. Uh, the, uh, you know, all the detective magazines wrestling magazines uh they appeared in a uh, soldier of fortune guns and ammo now anybody who would buy a guns and ammo magazine that likes you know guns or gun collecting even field and stream for hunters uh sports afield because uh, i had subscriptions for all those magazines right because as a young kid and everything i always liked collecting guns i always liked you know rifles and stuff and although when I got married, I got rid of all the ones I had because, you know, my daughter was born and my oldest daughter and I didn't really want to have uh, guns in the house at the time. But the point I'm trying to say is what man doesn't like collecting stuff like that? And when when it came. Here, here I am. <laughs> oh, I, I figured, OK, I knew I was going to get a smile. There. But anyway, the point is that I think what made those companies so successful in mail order selling garbage to people is that when the, when you advertised inside 
a magazine like Sol- uh, not Soldier Forging, but uh, Guns and Ammo and stuff, and you see pellet firing guns for four ninety five, you think they're really pellet guns. So yeah, they were selling them like crazy. Well, you know what? I I think you know with Soldier and Fortune, they even they even took a little page from you know the mail order mystery side because you had Com Dante who you know sixties and seventies was real big on selling his his martial arts stuff and all that. And if you look at the Soldier of Fortune, they had and even Paladin Press, they had all these you know crazy martial artists that were selling you know all kinds of these different crazy courses on how to be the deadliest person with your hands and all this and that. And if you look at them, they all, you know, take a page from, you know, when Count Dante had, had his stuff, because I've, I've seen, you know, in the army, I had, I seen a few guys that ordered that stuff and it was just completely garbage what they would get for their money. You know, you'd get a, a VHS tape and a little booklet of, you know, some guy throwing punches at a punching bag and, you know, you're like, you know, you look at it now and it's same stuff that Count Dante, you know, was doing. So they just capitalized on it a little bit and added, you know, VHS and, you know, this and that and spruced it up a bit. And, you know, they, you, they, they definitely took it from, from mail order, you know, mystery stuff. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing. Um, and this, I think Todd, this will be, uh, it's something I'm going to have to get to your hands. When you say Count Dante, I think, the closest person to Harold Van Brohut would be Count Dante because he was a master manipulator of the word. Like he would take an ad and blow it up to whatever it is and it would sell. Just like Harold would take any product, remanufacture it, redo whatever and sell the same product 10 times over with 10 different ways. Yeah. Count Dante, what made him so popular, especially is he would call himself the deadliest man alive, you know? Yeah. And, and stuff like that would, you know, he would just stand out in comic books because all the comic books had Kyle Dante's uh, page. Uh, in fact, I I think very li- there's very little comic books that don't have those ads in it. But one thing I'm going to say, there's a famous writer, and I think he writes for, I forgot the name of the magazine. It's something like People Magazine, but it's, it's kind of like a parody magazine kind of thing, you know, it makes fun of, of things. And he wrote an entire article there called The Deadliest Ads Alive, you know? <laughs> it's about 10 pages. It, it was a couple of years ago that it was written. But if you Google it, The Deadliest Ads Alive, you'll come to the to the article. And it's really fascinating because it goes on to explain. And I think, Todd, if you were to read it, you'll see what I'm talking about, the similarities between Harold and... Uh, and Count Dante in how good, you know, they were, they were master marketers. Yeah. Absolutely. And if, and if there's people out there that have never picked up a, you know, a, a soldier of fortune magazine from the eighties or nineties, you know, try to find some and look at them and compare what they did in their, um, in their like pushing of ads compared it to, the mail order side, like mail order novelties. It was basically soldier of fortune had stuff in there that was basically mail order mysteries for the grown up, because the majority of the stuff they sold was complete crap. I mean, I, I, I remember looking at a lot of stuff from, from pellet and press and all that, that they would advertise in there that, you know, you could be the deadliest sniper alive. If you, you buy this book and you know, the book was just basic marksmanship, you know, stuff that you could find in any magazine or in that, or you could be, you know, learn how to kill a man, you know, with your hands. And it was basically how to throw a punch, you know, or, or hook and all that. So they were basically taking what mail order mysteries did for kids and they just amped it up a little bit for adults. That That's, that, that's exactly what right. they did. <laughs> now it's was- my turn to talk. <laughs> yeah, I was about well before. Hey, Todd, you're still there. Hey, welcome to House of the Unusual we're, podcast. We're going to segue <laughs> from real violence to little <laughs> plastic flat toy violence, and we're going to talk about flats from the comic book ads Ooh. because those were really prolific. Is that page eleven of the book, or the, that uh, page thirty, starting on page thirty-four? Okay, toy Next soldier week. flats. What what can you say? I, I mean, I'll tell you when you want me. I'll tell you the history about that. Yeah, but uh, go ahead. You uh, 
Well, I don't know, but it's, I mean, it's something that you see, you see repeatedly in comic books. And I have to say, I, I'm looking through this. Um, I have, of course, the toys, the hundred toy soldiers. I have the 132 Roman soldiers. I have the 204 revolutionary soldiers. I have the 104 King Knight soldiers. I have the hundred toy pirates and I have the hundred little dolls. And there's another set, though, that is uh, Cowboys and Indians that I think predates all of those. And I think they were done by, um, Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, Levine, the, uh, the ant farm guy. And there, there's somebody here that has that Cowboys and Indians set, but I'm not going to say who. I bought it by accident. I was I don't even know why I bought it. No, I, I have it. I, I actually got oh, it. you have it? No, because I have it too. Yeah. I bought it on eBay and I pay, I forget what it was, like $80. I'm like, why would I buy this junk, you know? Actually, yeah, um, a buddy of mine gave gave it to me uh, a couple years ago and I, I didn't know what they were. I said, you know, because I was so used to, you know, I, I never really knew too much about the flats. I was, you know, in the 80s, it was the, you know, the three-dimensional green army men or the you know, the three-dimensional cowboys and Indians that were plastic. So I'd never, I had never, this was the first time that I was introduced to the flats and it was a, a cowboys and Indian set. you to take a picture of it, Joe. I'd like to, I'd like to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Let me tell you something, you know, the picture thing, I think inside his body and mind and soul, he's actually asking for the set. Joe. <laughs> yeah. Don't kid yourself. The picture's yeah, what's it worth? going in. What's it worth to you, Todd? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. If there were, if you were sitting on a sea monkey flat set, uh, I would just, I would just have to drive to your house and club you over the head and take it. Was there a sea monkey flat set? No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why. That's why you say. See, I, I'm gonna. Sounds, it sounds like it's something that should be uh, should be produced pretty soon, now. Huh? Yes, let me uh, let me elaborate something here for you guys. I'm gonna give a little lesson to you guys uh, concerning all those sets. Most of that stuff, yeah, was Levine that produced and stuff. But the the company that actually sold them was the Lucky Toy Company, and the Lucky Toy Company. One of the guys who took over that company, whatever was left of it. Back in probably, I don't know, 1995, 96, uh, I got a hold of him. Uh, we were talking at the time. And what he had done is, uh, because of the fact that he couldn't produce any more of the flats like they used to be sold, he actually put the whole thing, a kit, and he made the 101 toy soldiers, but he used round, you know, round soldiers, and he packed them into a crate. And the crate itself, you know, was kind of like, like he tried to remake the whole thing again. I actually have two of those crates because I had thought about selling them through my mail order ads at the time. And that's why I got a hold of him. The Lucky Toy Company, though, uh, believe it or not, there's very little history on it. Even really avid collectors that know about mail order and stuff, which is not too many. I think uh, I mean, I might be like the only one left, I think. But um they, you know, I, I remember we, I discussed, I did some research on it. Now, they did make the 100 little dolls, which I do have it too. Um, I have the flats. I have the Roman soldiers. I have it because I don't know exactly why, because I think other than the Roman soldiers and the 101, the others are not that popular. Um, in fact, I believe the company also produced one time uh, an ice rink or something like that. And you know what? This might be crazy, Todd. And no, I'm not going to give you my address. Okay. <laughs> I've got it. But I have something now come to think of it. There was something produced and it might be a, it might be a Harold uh, product. If you look at Boys Life magazine, I need to now do and, and try to see. But there was some type of, I don't know, like a, I think it has something with ice or something, either for sea monkeys or something that I know I have. Um, okay, really I'll, I'll I'll find something to blackmail, blackmail you for, so I can have that. And aside from Lucky Products, so there was also Helen of to of Toy. What was the difference between those two? Do you know, Eddie? 
It's the same company. It's the same, same company, company. It's a different name. Yeah. Helen of Toys. It's kind of like guaranteed distributors and the Milton Company. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Interesting. Like you, you had guaranteed distributors. Honor House became guaranteed uh, distributors. The guaranteed company was the same as the Melton Company. The guy who used the Melton Company to sell the bat and the guarantee to sell the ghost or vice versa. And he would use two addresses in the same area. Um, but that's basically it. There was a lot of guarantee companies and there was a lot of... Uh, now, the Helen of, of Toy Company and Lucky Toy Products, the difference is Lucky Toys were very early in the 1950s and 60s. And then it became Helen of Toys. Okay. And they, I, I think they were based out of Long Island, if I'm correct. Do you know, is, was there any connection between um, Levine and like old Cracker Jack prizes that were kind of this, constructed the same way? I could tell you this is the, the only reason I'm telling you this is from the guy who told me about it. The guy who actually had taken over the company, whatever was there. I mean, it's many, many years, uh, Todd. I haven't discussed the su subject, I think, in 20 years. But I recall him saying to me that it was all, that they were all done either in Hong Kong or they were done in Long Island, New York. Because Long Island, New York, I think there was a company, a big giant company that was producing at the time, they produced um, tr trade show uh, you know, uh, displays for the trade shows and stuff like that. And they were like in charge of the trade shows, like in New York City, from the Jacob Javits. To, yeah. And and they used to do all that stuff. And actually, that same company was the one that used to do the tank for Honor House. Now, I found the company name through Dan Goodsell that we had him in our show one time. And Dan is the guy that produces Mr. Toast. And what had happened is Dan likes collecting original um, art and stuff like that from the 50s and, and 60s. And when me and Kirk were signing autographs of the book up in Mail Order Mysteries in uh, the Comic-Con in 2011, uh, Kirk introduced me to Dan. And Dan actually was kind enough to show me a photograph because I had not seen the tank from Honor House prior to that time. And he showed me the exact tank. So I was able to see what the tank looked like. Cause I have a, you know, he has the, an original photograph that I think they had in their sales book. Um, and that's later I found out through asking my sources that Honor House used to produce the tank with this company and the, the submarine and everything. Cause the tank, the submarine, and the rocket ship all use the same body. The only thing that's different is the tip and the back of it. For the rocket, it would be obviously a pointed nose, the but it's the same exact uh, frame and everything in it, including when they did the space shuttle later on in life, which uh, I think the space shuttle, they, they produced. I'm not sure how many. I had three of them. I built one. Uh, the other two I lost in the fire. And all I have are like the instructions and the instrument panel left from, from the space shuttle. But uh, the space shuttle, I think, came into production 1984, 85, and it was being sold through guaranteed distributors. Now, like I said, the melting company would be guaranteed company. The honor house became guaranteed distributors. And believe it or not, as we speak, they're still in business today. Um, last time I contacted them, they were trying to sell me an overload of stock that they had of those pellet firing guns. And I'm like, what am I going to do with that junk? You know, <laughs> but uh, I think the lady was trying to sell uh, me and Dave Harvest, which actually uh, we inquired about it. Uh, but yeah, the, the story, and I'm going to tell you right now, Todd is very vague with the Helen of toy and lucky products. It's very, very vague. There's not too much, it's one of those things kind of like, uh, and Joe would know what I'm talking about. In Hoboken, there was a famous company. A lot of monster collectors think that they can go there today and find a treasure of, you know, monster items. They used to produce a Halloween bucket that was fa fashioned after uh, Boris Karloff. Oh, yeah. And that Halloween bucket does as much as five, ten thousand $10,000 when it goes on sale. 
And uh, I'm literally about a mile away, two miles from the site, which now is condominiums. But a lot of people have one th- one guy one time was really it was really funny. He goes to me, Eddie, don't say where it is. You don't want other people to go there. And I'm like, dude, there's nothing there. I mean, I went there. The company doesn't exist. It's gone. Um, because everybody, I think, in their mind, they hope that one day they can drive over, like in Danbury, Connecticut, if I'm if I'm correct, that's where the Topstone factory was, or something like that. And I know people like you know they dream of going to where the house is and maybe finding a stash of products. I could tell you this much, and uh, for anybody out there that's listening, when the Fun Factory was in business in the 1980s, there was another company, of course, which we spoke of, which was called the Fun House. The Fun House goes back to the early 70s. And the Fun House was the one that always advertised uh, the two bags of dollars, which inside Mail Order Mysteries, there's a copy of the ad in there. And it, 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 there's actually pictures there of the actual item, which uh, Kirk photographed from my collection, the the $1 million you know, dollars they would send you. But the thing I wanted to say, when that man passed away, Right before his passing, about a year earlier, I had spoken to him and I had thought about going down to where he was in Newark, where his warehouse was, that he had all those novelties. And believe it or not, the guy passed away and I think the wife discarded everything. I recently reached out to his wife a few months ago and um, she basically told me there's nothing left. I think they just got rid of it. But the point is, for anybody who was a treasure finder, that which I kind of had an opportunity and I lost it, you know. But there are possibly, but the Helen of Toy Company, it's, I mean, you can do a little more research on the internet. There's not too much on the subject. Yeah. Or, you know, the I know they did come from Long Island. That's a fact. They were either produced in Long Island or they were shipped overseas to Long Island. But the company, Helen of Toys and all that stuff, that was all located in New York City. Interesting. Well, you know, it, 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 you can tell, like, if you look at um, if you look at flats, and then you look at the ant farm that has that little um, farm landscape in it. That's basically what it is. Is it's a little, uh, you know, set of flats with a a little farmscape in it. So it's very it's very obvious where. Um, you know, how they progressed from the uh, making the little plastic flats to making the ant farm. Well, here's to, here's another animal altogether. The Uncle Milton Company, which was, you know, Uncle Milton, as I spoke in the earlier podcast, Joe Cosman, Joseph Cosman was the nephew of the guy who had Uncle Milton. And Joseph Cosman is the guy who introduced the potato gun into the country, the Uncle Milton ant farm, all that stuff. It had the name of his uncle, but Joseph, which I, I spoke with Joseph Cosman on two occasions. I had the, the opportunity to actually speak to him. And the guy was phenomenal. But I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure if the ant farms were, and this is why I'm bringing this up. I don't think the ant farms and the Helen of Toy Company have anything to do with each other. You follow what I'm saying, Todd? They were definitely not produced by the same manufacturer. If that's what you're thinking about, no, but I'm, th- I'm thinking that the, I mean, I think they're the inspiration. Yeah, I know it's what you're saying. Well, not yes and no, because I mean, the ant farms were probably early '70s. Lucky Products and 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 Helen of Toys they go back to the '50s. No, uh, ant farm goes back to '57. It's really an early. It's an early product. Yeah, you, you know what? You might, you definitely, you definitely got, got me thinking on that because I, I mean, it's not something I was really elaborating too much time on because even though it's been uh, something in our childhood, it wasn't the seven foot ghost. It wasn't the, yes, I'm going to say the robot plants. Oh, well, take a drink. Everyone out there, take a drink. It wasn't, take a drink. It um, <laughs> so I didn't really, but you know what? Let's be honest. It's kind of like, um, they, it might have inspired, but I know that I have some comic books that have 10 cents in the cover and they're like really 19, late 40s, 
uh-huh. uh, some comic books that are Harvey publications. And I got to tell you, they had in there the Helen of Toy Company. So they're really, really old. So I don't know which of the two is actually older. Um, I'm a little rusty in my research yeah, now. Yeah. I've been older. <laughs> yeah. I don't know either, but I know I know that uh, that was how kind of one of the things that Levine uh, got his start at was was doing flats of some kind. I, actually, I think the cowboy and Indian was his was his original set, and then I think that eventually segued into the um, the farm scene for the ant farm. But I could see also, but you see, if you see the the hundred. Um... Because one thing that you also forgot about, they also used to produce was 100 uh, elephants or something like that, made of ivory, <laughs> as they would say. Remember those? No, I don't remember those. You never seen the 100. In fact, if you look, I think in that catalog you just took got from me. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I said took, because I think I feel you took it from me. But anyway. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I couldn't say no to you, especially the threats I got. You know, I was I, like, I, I must. I must give it to him, you know? I'm an opposing figure. Yes, exactly. So uh, <laughs> the point is, I think in there you'll see it, but if not, Google it. It's it's 100 elephants uh, the size of a bean or something, and they're supposed to be made of ivory. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you that remember? I, yeah. They're the same company. They're all, all those came from the same manufacturer, basically. I understand what you're saying, the ant farm, because of the scene. And I could see a crisscross there, but I know uh, from what I, what a Joseph Cosman told me, uh, he had those stuff made over in, in, I think it was Japan. I don't think it was China, because China in that time was not a, a popular place to, to go. It was more Taiwan or Hong Kong. Um, or made in Japan, you know, because we're talking early 70s, you know. But I think he, I believe he told me that he made them overseas. Probably, um, that could be. Yeah, but then again, you know what, so that's what I'm saying. I don't know if there is a connection. I can see, because you can see in everything you see in mail order, um, you basically can trace everything to one major catalog that was published in the 60s, which was the uh, House of a Thousand Mystery, Vic Lawson. And then if you look at all the ads that he has in that catalog, and then you start looking at all this mail order companies from, you know, Johnson Smith to whatever, and they have similarities. Now, one thing we got to know here for a fact, the one that basically invented everything was Johnson Smith. Was that a fact I liked as a kid? No, because I, my favorite was Honor House, and I wanted Honor House to be better than Johnson Smith. But I can tell you this much, though. Johnson Smith has probably the appearance of most of the items we grew up with made their first debut in Johnson Smith products. Yeah. But that goes back. That goes back so damn far. But it, it so did. Which came first, though, Eddie? Johnson Smith or S.S. Adams? Uh, S.S. Adams was 1906. Johnson Smith was 1912. S.S. Adams. Well, hey guys, we I hate to butt in here on this conversation, but we're down to two minutes here. So, Todd, take about thirty seconds and um, give us some some final words and let us know of if you were stuck on an island, what's the one novelty that you would take with you? Oh, oh, I, I don't know. It would be something from Trans Science, and it would probably be my invisible goldfish. An invisible goldfish, nice. Eddie, what about you? You're you're stuck on an island. You could only bring one of your mail order novelties with you. Which one is it? It would be the ghost, because this way I can always fly off the island. Yeah. I it. <laughs> but I, I, I honestly think, knowing things, I think Todd would probably, even though he said the invisible goldfish, he would probably take the hypno glasses, because this way he figured anybody in the island, he can put them on and hypnotize them. Under his and they'll, be, they'll be under his spell. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Joe? Oh, what would I take? Oh man, I, I don't know. Maybe the uh oh that, that that's a tough one. You're the one that brought up yeah, the I say. <laughs> no. That that is a uh that's definitely a tough one. Which one would I take? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna say maybe the uh the Count, Don, the Count Dante uh 
mail order ad. That way I could I could learn how to fight and I, I could use it to fight off any uh, animals or native tribes that are coming to try to get me. How about it's that? It's an empty island. You said it's an empty <laughs> island. There's nobody that's, that's, there. There we are back to violence. <laughs> oh gosh. I'll blame it on Eddie. But hey, guys, uh, thanks for, for joining us once again, Todd and, and Eddie. Uh, everybody out there in podcast land, thank you once again for checking us out. Uh, and head over to your favorite podcast platform, subscribe to our channel, give us a like, head over to YouTube, look us up, House of the Unusual, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, give our videos a like, and just you know go over there and enjoy yourself. So uh, once again, everybody in podcast land, thank you for joining us. Eddie and Todd, it's been a pleasure, and thank you. Yep. Good night, guys. Bye now. Good night.